We welcome you, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles, I'd ask if you will be so kind to turn with me to the Revelation of John, the 12th chapter. Revelation 12 and 12. It is one verse. One of the things I also want to remind you while you're turning, we will be on a Wednesday night be having a special healing service in the commons. We're going to anoint anyone who's been ill. If you have a need and you want to be standing in for that, we're going to have a little service, and then we're going to spend some time in prayer. And anybody in the house that would like that, we want to, a lot of great things going on this summer. We want you to be a part of it. I'm excited about this word, Revelation 12 and 12. While you're turning there, I'll tell you, the Lord gave me this sermon at the best place in the world, all right, sitting on the beach in a chair by myself, staring out the wonders of God and what he's created. I began to do some reading and some studying there, and just God just birthed something in my spirit. And I'm really excited to give it to you today, and I hope the Lord will help me to be able to give this. Again, Revelation 12 and 12. If you're there, please say amen. Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. Look at this. For the devil's come down to you in great wrath. You want to know why you've been facing things and why it's been so hard? He's come down in great wrath. Do you know why he's come down in great wrath? Look at that. Somebody read it with me. Because he knows his time has short. He's mad because he knows he's running out of time. I want to talk to you on a thought that's going to seem a little ludicrous to you, but go with me on this. I want to talk to you this morning on a thought. It's simply titled, A Two Chicken Church. A Two Chicken Church. I will tell you this sermon is extremely popular in Kentucky. The people there absolutely love it. Colonel Sanders is a big fan. So again... But I believe God's got a word for us. Don't, don't be thrown by the title. Anybody ready to receive a word from God this morning? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray today your anointing in this house that you would help me. Father, to deliver this word with passion, zeal, and anointing. And I pray, God, Lord Jesus, that you would help me. God, Lord, just to let this be a form of my worship. God, I know it's burning in my spirit. Help me to be able to do, do my best in delivering it. But God, let there be anointing and power in the house. If anybody's ready to receive the word of the Lord, let somebody say amen in this house. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Before, let me just give you a little precursor, okay? I'm aware of the time. My first point's a little lengthy, but second and third are really short compared to the first. So if we get in the middle of the first, I'm not going to say we're about to close or anything like that. I just want you to know where we are so you don't get nervous at the first point and say, oh goodness, we're going to be here a little bit, but we're not. Now, having said that, let's focus on the Word. See, one of my great passions outside of church and family, without a doubt I can tell you what it is, is World War II. In fact, if they passed the law and they said, Brother Donnie, you're a terrible preacher, we don't ever want to hear you preach the gospel again, and they drove me away with torch and pitchforks, I would probably end up at a college somewhere teaching on World War II. You know why? To me, no event changed the course of American history more than this war. I, I, I want to uh, Think about this. Some of you may not know this, and i got to move on. It's important for us to grasp this, though. You know, it thrust us from a young nation that had more horses than tanks into the superpower we are today. And this was done by the greatest generation that ever lived. Now, at times I say things about our generation. I want to make clear, I'm not knocking our generation in this church, but if you turn on CNN and you turn on Fox News, you can see a little bit of what our generation has to offer. You know, they're protesting certain candidates, and you put a microphone in their face, and they're like, why are you protesting? I don't know. I'm just protesting. So, I mean, again, we got some great people. So if you hear me say that, I'm not knocking that. But even in that, let me tell my generation, We have nothing on the greatest generation that ever lived. Think about this. They faced two empires of tyranny, nationwide rations, the draft, a great sacrifice that brought freedom to millions and saved the entire race of the Jews. It's it's hard for my generation to hear this, but I need you to understand my generation. At the beginning of World War II, we were not a superpower. In fact, did you know where we were on the scale of superpowers? We had the 20th largest army in the world. Just to put that in perspective, if it was modern day, we would be modern day Thailand. So think about that. We were not a superpower. But here in all this, we, we, we see the great generation grave up and they fought and they destroyed tyranny and it made America great. In fact, can you do me a favor? Can we tell this generation real quick, can we give them just gratitude for being the hero generation that they were? You ought to be happy you're not speaking German today. And it's because of that generation. Now, having said that, I had to tell you that. Because why did I have to tell you that? Because if America wasn't the superpower, who was? Germany. Germany was the superpower. Think about this for just a second. Most people don't know this. But during this war, 
Germany had fully functional rockets. Nowhere near it. I mean, think about it. Their tanks were far above anybody else's. Their air forces, in fact, they conquered France in, what, like 30, 45 days? They were just highly uh, evolved fighting units. And, and once they run the British out of uh, France, Britain realized they could not fight Germany. And Germany began to pummel them by the air. It was nothing to hear air raids and here come German bombers to bomb you. They could not stop the Luftwaffe, as it was called. And they began to fight. They couldn't fight them straight up. To complicate matters, this is what I found out. Germany began to paint their bombers, which were slow, black. And they began to dive bomb and deliver their load at, at, at night. And they, the, the British Air Force, anti-aircraft, couldn't do anything because they couldn't see them. And what was interesting here is... Darkness goes two ways. If you can't see them because it's dark, then they can't see what they're doing in the dark. But did you know that they were able to deliver with such precision, the, such bombing, that they destroyed factory after factory, and they began to completely destroy the uh, ability of England to produce the weapons that they needed. Now, why are you saying all this? Because how does someone fly at night? In 1940, in a code named Headache, the English discovered something. In just, in just a couple of weeks before um, what would be known as the Battle of Britain, they found out why the Germans could be able to bomb with such precision, how they could fly at night with people that had relatively low training. And what they discovered was is that Germany would send out these two radio stations in northern Germany, and they were sending out a signal that was called Knickerbein. Now, this was, was interesting. It was literally beeps, and, 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 and long as they listened to the signal from home, they were able to fly right on target. And then it went from dashes to a long pause of beep, and when that was it, it meant hit. And England couldn't understand why they could bomb with such great precision. But what happened was something in a brilliant move. Instead of going and destroying these radio stations, Instead of jamming the signals, they did something very interesting. Do you know what they did? They set up two Knickerbein stations of their own. And what happened is when the great battle of Britain, they began to fly, and they got over their designated payload. But now because they were not listening from the signal at home, but they was listening to the enemy's signal, they got off course. They delivered a message for home saying, we just destroyed the Rolls-Royce factory that just creates all the Spitfire in engines for the Royal Air Force. But they hadn't. Because they listened to the wrong signal, do you know what they really had done? They had managed to bomb an open farmland. They dropped 500,000, a half a million tons of explosives, and they only managed to kill two lives, the lives of two chickens. A half a million tons of explosives, explosions, precisions. But because they listened to the wrong signal, instead of destroying what they were supposed to, instead of showing their might, they end up killing only two chickens. Now, what I need to tell you, you might not want to hear today, but hear me for just a second. The church has a lot in common with the German army. You know what I mean? We're Nazis. Okay, but you need to hear this. Number one, I need you to understand something. Britain couldn't destroy Germany. Germany was the superpower. In the same way, I just need to stop and tell the church, in this story, you are the superpower. See, in your mind, you want to think that a lot of times that we're like England and that we're just hovering in a corner, and here comes the big bad enemy, and we're just trying to hide, and we're just trying to fight, and we're just trying to get through, and we're just trying to hold on till Jesus comes. And if we can pray enough and seek enough and sing enough, we'll just make it through this terrible attack. But can I stop here and remind you, in this story, you're not England, you're Germany. The devil is England. We are German. We are the superpower. What do you mean? Do you remember what the Bible tells us in Matthew? I believe it's 18, 16 and 19, 18, 19. It tells me like this. It says, upon this rock I shall build my church, and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Can I remind you that the gate is not an offensive weapon? It's a defensive weapon. I want to tell you that we are the superpower. When the church makes up its mind to listen to the signal from home, the devil can't stop us. The gates of hell have got to swing wide and let us go take what belongs to us. We look at the high things the enemy set up and we cast them down in the name of Jesus Christ. But in these last 
days, we want to complain like we're Britain. We want to say, Brother Donnie, you don't understand. What are we going to do in face of such evil and the devil's running rampant? I, this generation of church, and me included, so often we just want to complain, don't we? I can't even watch the news because it fuels my complaining. Fox or CNN, it's all bad. My temper's going to get up. But we want to sit here and we want to complain, don't we? Brother Don, you don't understand. They're passing terrible laws. They're passing horrible laws. And now we don't even know which bathroom to use. And an evil man could go in there with my daughter. And I don't know. Can I See, that's my point. Let me just remind you for just a second that on inside of you is something greater that would ever be in Parliament, that will ever be in Congress or in the White House. They can pass every law that they want to. But when I go to the bathroom, it might seem silly to you, but I still got the Holy Ghost on the inside of me. And I believe that God can do such a stirring in my life that somebody might go to that door and say, well, I don't think, I don't even have a reason why, but I feel like going to this one today. I just want to remind the church of this age, we are not some weakling. We are the superpower of God that can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What about the generation of the first church? Do you know it was an outlaw to be a Christian? Let me remind the church of who we are. It was an outlaw. You know what they did to our Lord, Jonathan? I'll tell you what they did. They crucified him. They beat him and mocked him. And then if you were a believer, do you know what they did? They would take you and feed you to lions or crucify you. But they still worshiped because they understood something. They understood that greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. Can I remind you what toppled the Roman Empire? In 300 short years, it went from being an outlaw to be a Christian to the official religion of the Roman Empire. Theodosius said, I don't know, but God's doing something in me. Not only is it not outlawed, but I'm telling you that anybody who don't serve Jesus is breaking the law. This is our, can I tell you, they can pass what they want to pass. They can do what they want to do. It's not going to change the fact that when I walk wherever I go, I've got the Holy Ghost in me, the Lord in front of me, goodness and mercy behind me, and the angels of the Lord and kept all around behind me. We are the superpower. The second thing we get in common with these is simply this, that in these last days, like the German army, we've ignored the signal from home. We've ignored God's signal, and we've started listening to the beacons of the enemy. The enemy's smart. He knows he can't fight you. He knows he can't stop you. He cannot defeat you. you got to get, I wish we could think like the enemy sometimes. We wouldn't complain as much. We know the devil's defeated. You know why he's mad? He's mad because he knows his time is short. So instead of fighting this one-on-one, which he cannot do, he's created signals in these last days. And the problem is today's people are listening to these signals. A signal, a beacon of it's all about me. Church is about me, Brother Donnie. You've you got to give me a goose bump, and I've got to be fed, and I've got to be a place to grow and do my ministry. And we've forgotten about the Great Commission, and we put it on our own commission. And we've made it about us. It's the, it doesn't matter what I do because God knows my heart attitude. That goes directly against Scripture. If I had time, I would just preach one after another. Come do what the world is doing, hunger. Or you can have Christ without the commitment outlook. Or Jesus is my co-pilot method. Or prayer and worship is optional approach. And we've done all these beacons. And today's church is listening to the wrong things. And the once force that could not be to stop is finding itself ineffective. Do you want to know why? Because we're listening to the wrong signals. Even believers today, I want to remind you, friend, you're so powerful that you're not a conqueror. Jesus said you're more than a conqueror. So why are we faltering? Why? Are, because we're listening to the wrong things. If we read our Bible half as much as we read our iPad, somebody help me now. If we give God glory and honor for what he's done instead of complaining for the things he hadn't given us, if we would get off these beacons, we'd see great things, which brings me to the third way we're like them. Because we've become ineffective. Instead of delivering a great blow to the enemy in these last days, we've only managed to kill a few chickens. See, see, go with me on this. How many people know if you went to the field that night, you'd have seen the fireworks? You drop a half a million tons of explo- half a million pounds of explosives on something, it's gonna light up the sky. And here's the problem today. 
we go through the, the motions of locking and loading, and we drop our payload. And, buddy, we can light up some songs. We can light up some preaching. We can light up some programs. We know when to say amen. We know what buttons to push. But at the end of the day, because we've listened to the wrong signals, we might be creating some fireworks, but we're simply not creating the force. Somebody help me in this building. You know what I'm talking about. I, anybody just ready just to see God do what he promised, that even greater things than these in my church shall do? And I was praying on the beach a couple of weeks ago. I was by myself. Carrie had already gone over to Mobile. I was sitting there. God dropped a word in my heart, and I'm telling you, I believe it. He said it is time for my power to be back in my church. And if we can get tuned in from the signal of God and stop letting the enemy pull us this way and stop letting our own desires pull us this way, but instead make up my mind, I'm tuning into God and God alone. It might not make much sense. I'm flying in the dark, but God, I'm trusting your signal. I'm ignoring the lies of the devil. I'm listening to the false doctrine of this world. I'm tuned in to you, God. And when I make up my mind to tune in, not two chickens are going to get killed, but about a 10,000 devils are going to get stomped. The church cannot be stopped when we dial ourselves in. Families dial in. Individuals die in. You can do this if you will simply trust in the strength of God. So let's look real quickly at three Ps. Three Ps of the enemy's signal. And, and I love this. See, the enemy, the Luftwaffe, was able to get off their path because of the enemy. So the number one point is the enemy's signal will get you off the right path. I began to pray this week and I said, God, would a a great story and a great thought and a great thing in your, my spirit, but show me something. And I came across this story, and you know it well. It's in Acts. The only time I have for Scripture will be this story, but let's look. It says, after much time had been lost, sailing had already become dangerous because now it was after the Day of Atonement. So look at this. So Paul warned the men, I can see our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to the ship and the cargo but also to our own lives as well. Now, I want you to understand this. Paul is dialed in. Paul represents the voice of God. He's not just speaking a hunch. He's telling the centurion what God has told him. Now, the centurion, if you've ever watched an old cop show, he's managed to commandeer this boat. He's just taking the boat. He's saying, you're taking me and all these prisoners to Rome. i got to deliver this guy. So understand, the voice of God is trying to tell the one who's steering this ship, who's in charge of it, we don't need to leave. You need to listen to the voice of God. But look at the very next scripture. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. He's saying, this is what God is saying. This is what God is doing. This is what God will do if you'll just listen. But instead of listening to the voice of God, this guy goes for the sailor and the owner. Now, I want you to think about this thought real quick right here. Duh. Of course he's going to listen to them. Not only was the owner and the, the sailor, you know what, you, the, the captain, you know what they both were? They were both sailors. Paul wasn't. He made tents. You don't listen to a tent maker when you're about to take a voyage on the sea. See, there's going to be people that always seem like they know better, that they know more, that they have a better understanding. Can I tell you something? Your doctor knows more than your pastor about health. Your lawyer knows more about law than your pastor or someone who's got a word from God in this, in this building. And I'm not saying listen to them is bad. It makes sense. They know more. Here's the problem. I have to say it like this. In these last days, too often, we want to listen to our sailor rather than the saint. We, 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 we know that it makes more sense. And on our boat, we got a sailor saying, you don't want to do that. This is the way. That don't even make sense. But you've got the voice of God saying, hold on, keep praying. Hold on, don't do that yet. I'm aware that your business is not looking good, but I'm telling you, God's saying, hold on. Oh, I, I, you, you might have a problem and the devil's telling you, you know, and everybody's making sense. Look, you're never going to find anybody who's going to help you raise them kids. You just need to do this and you just need to do that. But then you have the voice of God on the same ship saying, hold on, don't listen to that junk. God's got something and God's got somebody. See, the problem is so often today, we want to listen to the sailor and not the saint. We want to listen to that voice that's saying, give up. Don't pray anymore. Your fasting's not working. 
God doesn't have anybody out there for you. Your children are never going to make it to be something. You're not going to do this. You're not going to do that. And there are people in this building today where you're listening to your sailor. It makes sense. It makes sense to the mind. Why do I listen to the sailor then, Brother Dan? Why, why must I listen to the saint and not the sailor? Because I love this next scripture. This is what Paul said. He said, look to them, and he said, look, you can see what you want to see. And I know you're good on your compass, and I know you know the maps, and I know you know how to chart it out. I'm aware I don't even know how to raise the mast or raise the sail. But can I tell you something? I see something you don't see. Can I tell you why sometimes you don't need to listen to your sailor, but you need to listen to the saint? Because God can see something that your sailor can't see. God can see something that they can't see. And it might not make sense to you. It might not make sense to the sailor. But I choose to trust the one who can see it all and knows it all. In fact, I got some bullet points for you I'd like to share with you. Think about this. Your sailor rightfully might be saying, you need hundreds of baskets to feed a multitude, but God sees something you don't see. He just said, you just need a little boy's lunch. Your sailor might be saying, you need to run out and get some more wine for the wedding, but God says, just bring me some H2O. You know, there's more to that. Your sailor might rightly be saying, you're building a boat in the desert? You're crazy. It doesn't make sense. Where's the water at? But God says, you better hurry because rain's on the way. Your sailor might say, you need armor to fight a giant, but God sees the only thing that's going to work is a slingshot. You might look out and see that there's only one way I can get to Nineveh. I can only get to Nineveh by a boat, but God says, I've got a biological submarine heading your way. It might not be first class, but you're going to get right where I need you to do. You might be saying, God needs a warrior to save a nation, but God sees I don't need a warrior. I need a beauty queen. Can somebody call Esther? You look at it and you might say, I got to go borrow money to pay my taxes, but God sees a wallet swimming in the lake, and you might be looking for the birthplace of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and you're looking at every palace, but God sees something you don't see in the manger down the road, and the final thing, friend, today we might want to look out and see a rain cloud, as we want to look out and see all the rain in it, we look at it as a way to participate, uh, 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 bring forth particip precipitation, but can I tell you what Jesus sees? Jesus calls the clouds as the meeting place of not only the saints of God, but every saint we've already buried in the, in the graveyard. There's going to come a day where you look and see one thing, but God sees another. Don't look out and listen to your sailor. Listen to the voice of the saint. Give God glory and honor in this house today. How many people today just want to testify and say, Brother Donnie, I got a sailor. I just got a sailor. That's okay. I got one, so we got three people in this building that's got a sailor. Evidently, we're living with some perfect lives. I picked the wrong sermon on the right day. But let me tell you what my sailor says. Buddy, it ain't going to work out. God can't do that. Your children are always going to live with that. You're not going to get promoted. You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. God's going to leave you. God's going to forsake you. How can God work this out for you? Do you hear what the doctor's saying? Do you hear what your loved one is saying? Do you see this economy? And the whole time my sailor is talking in my ear, I've made up my mind. I'm not going to listen to my sailor. You might know what you're talking about. You might be good with this, and you might be good with that. But I choose to listen to one who can see it all, who knows it all, who spoke in my heart before this voyage began. I don't know who you're listening to today, but I've made up my mind. I'm going to listen to the saint. Come on, give God glory and honor in this house. Real quickly before we move on, I mean, what, why, why, why did he listen, the centurion listen to the sailor? And I come up with two reasons. And I'll put this scripture back up. But centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, Followed the advice of these guys. Now look at this. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided we should sail on. I don't have time to preach on the winter, but we make our worst decisions when we're facing winter. The time when it's fruitless, when it's cold, when it's bearing. We don't want to stay in the winter, so we tend to listen more to the sailor on a way to get me out. But sometimes, can I tell you, you just got a winter there. Oh, I wish I had time because you know where they end up wintering? Malta in an island with no buildings and no shelter. If they had just listened to God, I wish I had time, but I don't. i got to move on. The second thing I want you to notice about this, though, is this. Look at this scripture right here. It was unsuitable, but the majority decided to sail on. So guess what they did? They sailed on. Here's the problem with the church today. We have become infatuated with the majority. 
Either y'all are done with me, and that's fine, or somebody don't hear what I'm saying, that's okay. But I'm going to keep preaching regardless. Amen. I, I, amen myself. We've become infatuated with the majority, and the majority has learned to dictate the message. And the majority tells us what's okay to preach and what's not okay to preach. We're so worried with the majority that a lot of preachers today have sat on the message of God for fearing of, of hurting people. But can I tell you, my job is not to bring in the majority. My job is to preach the message of the minority. And I'm just telling you, you might not like some of the things I have to say, but the problem is in these last days, we want to go with the majority. Well, the majority says we shouldn't talk about the blood. The majority says you shouldn't preach conviction. The majority says you should just let people do what they want and say what they want as long as they're coming. What does it matter to you? And we've got so worked up on the majority. But let me ask you a question. Since when did the majority validate the message? Before we move on, i got a few little bullets for you. Think about this. You see... There were more outside of the ark than in it. There were more Egyptians than Hebrews, but the Hebrews still went marching out. 99.9% .9 of people bowed to the golden statue of Nebuchadnezzar, but that 0.1% changed an entire nation. There were more dry bones in the valley than living ones, but God still created an army. Oh, I'm still not done. Think about this. There were more prophets of Baal than prophets of God, but God's fire still failed. There were thousands of people mocking the 120 believers, but at the end of the day, that majority shifted by 3,000. At the Armageddon, can I tell you, we're going to be outnumbered. We're going to be outmatched. They're going to point nuclear missiles at us. They're going to have all kinds of fighter, fighters. They're going to have all all kinds of tanks, all kinds of things, nuclear bombs, but that's okay. When Jesus shows up, it won't matter what they point at us. The Bible says he'll consume them all with the word of his mouth. Don't worry about the majority. The majority will get you on Malta, but instead listen to what the one saint in the boat is saying. Hold on. Don't give up. Keep praying. Keep believing. Don't turn away. Keep doing what God has said for you to do. Number two, this is the one I enjoyed. You might not, but I enjoyed it. But see, because the signal of the enemy will move you from the right position. To save time, I can't read Scripture. Put it up. Uh, uh, no, it's not up. It's John. I believe it's 18. I'm pretty sure. Write that down in your notes so you can go home and study it. I don't have time to read it to you. But think about this. This is where Peter denies Christ. I've got to be honest with you. I've read this a million times, and I never noticed this. Peter goes to the front door of Caiaphas' house with another disciple. Chalk that up to ADD and reading comprehension. I never noticed that. One disciple gets to go in, and he's stuck on the outside of the door. Now, I think we should give the apostle Peter a lot of credit for being as close to Jesus as he could possibly get. They wouldn't let him in. That wasn't his fault. We want to bash him, but hear me. He had positioned himself right where he needed to be, as close to Jesus as possible. One disciple got to go in. We don't know who it is, and we don't know why, but they wouldn't let him out, so he stood on the doorstep. Can I tell you that he would begin to listen to the enemy's signal, and from there he would let the enemy push him off a position from where he had positioned himself as close to Jesus as possible, and then he got down by the fire. But then another signal of the enemy got a hold of him. You know where he ends up? The Bible says he ends up running away crying bitterly. He starts off in position. He walks away running off in defeat. And I begin to think about this. Do you know what drove him off of his position? There weren't statements. There were questions. Every one that was brought were questions. Read it for yourself. Questions. Not, hey, you're a disciple. Aren't you a disciple? Aren't you from Galilee? Don't you know Jesus? You might say, Brother Donnie, what does this have to do? When I began to pray this week, God just burst something in my spirit. The church started off unstoppable, changing cultures, changing the world, and the American church had positioned itself. God, I can't get any closer to you, and I'm not going to build the Tower of Babel, but we positioned ourselves right as close to you as I can possibly get. And now we find in ourselves getting pushed off a of position by questions. Don't believe me, ask Joel Osteen and T.D. Jakes. YouTube it. They get intimidated by these questions of CNN, and they don't want to answer basic Bible truth. Great men of God who greater than I am, I don't throw stones at them. They're at a bigger platform. But you know what they did? They got pushed out of position 
on a national stage to say that Jesus is the only way because they were afraid of questions. And today, we're scared of questions. Are you telling me that Muslims don't go to heaven? Question. I, 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 you know, I, God loves everybody. Are you telling me that Jews, the people of God, can't go to heaven because they don't acknowledge Jesus? Well, you know, I, I don't want to get into basic theology principles with you. You telling me that God just, you know, the God of love doesn't want someone to be with somebody just because they happen to be of the same sex? Are you telling me? Are you telling me? And this week I looked on Facebook. One of my friends, they don't go to church here. All they put was their answer. He said, this is my answer to the transgender question. And he put a scripture. Man should not wear man's clothes. Woman should not wear women's clothes. And sure enough, a question popped up. So you're telling me transgender people don't go to heaven? No replies. Let a couple days pass. See, I'll tell you, nobody in this building replies more to Facebook than I do, but nobody erases more of their replies than I do. I write about 100 a day, and I erase about 99. Anybody with me? I'm telling you, I'm typing. Backspace, 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 backspace. Just leave it alone. I learned a long time ago, don't argue with... People who have less intelligence, they're going to bring you down on their level, and they got more experience than you do, so just let it be. But this time it angered me a little bit in my spirit that the church is so scared to produce God's truth because they'll get labeled a bigot, that they'll get labeled wrong. And So you know what I did? I typed a reply, and all I put was 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Be not deceived. That no homosexual, anybody who practices sexual immorality shall enter the kingdom of heaven. And I put, I hope this answers your question, the end. See, this is my point. I, it's not, don't, please don't take this as hate speech. Listen, if, if, if someone's a homosexual, it's no different than a drunkard. If someone's, it, it's, it's sin. We're all sin. We're all sinners, okay? I'm not throwing stones. I don't want to focus on that agenda. I want to focus on where are the people of God that are getting pushed around because they don't want to look bad by answering the question. But just so we're in this building and we're all on the same page, I thought I'd produce a little bit of some information for you of what I believe and what we believe. So can, can we just touch on that for just a second? Just so you know, yes, I believe in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Yes, I believe it took six days to create the world. Yes, I believe that everybody on this earth came from Adam and Eve. I believe that God let Noah build an ark and put two of every unclean animal and uh, uh, seven of every clean one. Yes, I believe in the virgin birth. Yes, I believe in the blood of Jesus Christ. I believe believe that God gives grace to whom he gives grace to and he hardens the heart of those he wants to. Yes, I believe that my witness is the most important thing over where I go, what I watch, or what I ingest. Yes, I believe that wrong is wrong even though everybody's doing it and I believe right is right even though no one's doing it. Yes, I believe there's a heaven. Yes, I believe there's a hell. Yes, I believe I'm a sinner saved by grace, but that's not all. Yes, I believe that Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. Yes, I believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Yes, I believe we got to love everybody. Black, white, gay, straight with a godly love. Yes, I believe that Muslims, Jews, and Buddhists or anybody who does not acknowledge Jesus Christ is going to hell. Yes, I believe homosexuality to be young. Yes, I believe if you've got ovaries, you're a woman. If you're born with a prostate, you're a man. I, yes, I believe you wearing a dress makes you a woman like me wearing a collar makes me a dog. Yes, I believe that this world begins and the life begins in the womb and yes, I believe abortion to be in a barbaric event done with people with a seared conscience. I believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I believe in speaking in tongues. I believe in healing. I believe there's a mansion waiting on me, but I'm still not done. I believe God can raise people from the dead. I believe there's a devil and he's going swimming in a lake of fire. I believe in the rapture. I believe that one day Jesus will descend with a shout. And yes, I believe that every grave has to give up the righteous dead. But most importantly, I believe that Jesus was crucified, buried, and raised again so that I might have life and have it more abundantly. Somebody give God glory and honor in this house. Stand with us if you don't mind. Questions, questions has pushed us off and questions has knocked us around. Listen, 
I know there's too much love in my heart to be called a bigot. Let me tell you something. If you struggle with alcohol, you struggle with drugs, you struggle with homosexuality, doesn't matter what you struggle with, friend. My sins are equal to yours. We're not preaching against you. Would somebody just hear me? We don't say things like this because we're preaching out of hate. We're preaching these things because we believe them in our heart. And what kind of people would we be to watch people with a lifestyle damning them to hell and sit back and say, well, I'm scared what they might say if I preach the truth. Can I tell you, I know that what I say is not popular. I know that 90% of people my age won't preach it. There might come a day where I might have to go preach in a tent somewhere because this government has said you can't preach this and you can't preach that. But the day I stop preaching the word of almighty god you can have my license you can take my tie somebody come get my jacket because i didn't get in this to get paid i didn't get in this to talk to people i got in the gospel because there's only one way to save the lost and if we back off our principles what good are we yes we love you yes we'll pray with you yes we're equal to you Yes, we're sinners, but God's Word is God's Word. Either we believe it or we don't. Before we go home, the final thing, the enemy will cause us to lose our power. A church, I mean, I'm in a, an Air Force that should have killed factories, Buildings, forces, troops, kill two chickens. Anybody tired of living in a church age where you feel ineffective? I'm ready for there to be sick among us. Come to the altar. And because we've been praying and seeking and celebrating God, we take ordinary hands of ordinary people and allow a supernatural force to flow through our body and heal people. Why do I preach the way I do? Because I've seen too much. I've seen devils cast out. I've seen physical healings. I've seen people raised from the dead. I've seen things. I know it works. Think about Samson before we go home. Think about this, this scripture. Samson had said no to Delilah th three times. But this scripture tells me she kept nagging him to death until he finally told her everything. Because of that, he would find himself ineffective. The Philistines would get him and gouge him, put him around a train. And what I want to tell somebody is this. There's some people in here that find themselves like Samson. You've said no to the enemy's signal once. The enemy's tried to discourage you here today, and you've stood strong and said, not listening. You come on a little bit longer, and the devil tells you your children aren't going to make it. You're not going to do this. You're not going to do that. But you've ignored the signal of God. Can I tell you, the enemy's going to continue that beacon and try to wear you down until you finally give in and get pulled off. But learn from Samson, friend. Make up your mind. I'm not giving in to the old way of life. For the people in this building that battle addictions, that 90% of the people in this building can't comprehend because of the physical pull, the mental pull, no matter what, you're just constantly, every day you have to ignore that signal we got people in this building that have changed their lifestyle and said, I'm living for God. But every day you hear another signal beep and you want to, every day, stay strong. I want to drop you on this and then we're, pray, we're, we're praying right now. Do you know why the signal's getting louder? The signal got louder for the Luftwaffe because they were getting closer and closer to where they needed to be. The signal wasn't coming from home. The signal was coming from where they were bombing. And the signal got louder because they were getting right where they needed to be. The Bible says, don't grow weary in doing good. Don't grow weary from the signal of the enemy saying, give up. Getting pulled away. You want to know why? Satan's signal is getting louder because he knows his time is short. Do you know what you're carrying? Spiritual armory. Spiritual bombs, if you want to call them that. Firepower. The Bible says you shall receive power. The word power comes from dunamis, meaning dynamite, explosives. 
you're carrying something that the enemy does not want near his kingdom. So he's going to make his signal get louder and louder till you veer off and you kill two chickens. But how many people in this building today have made up your mind, I'm not killing chickens when I can stomp some devils. That the firepower that's on the inside of me is going to make its target. Mama, the enemy's been fighting you in your ear, telling you give up on your child. I'm here to tell you, don't listen to the signal of the enemy. The day's drawing nigh. For that person that's been praying for somebody into their life and you're lonely, and you don't know how lonely it is, and you don't know how long you can hold on, ignore the signal of the enemy. The devil's a liar. Someone's on their way. Dad, because your family doesn't know the stress that's on you, trying to keep the finances together and the weariness that's on you, I would tell you, stay strong. Don't listen to the signal of the enemy. There's firepower on the inside of you. There's firepower on the inside of you. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I just want to real quickly go over this. I just got to remind some people in this building today, you are carrying firepower. Firepower that can level the works of the enemy. The only way you don't make it is if you listen to the discouragement of the enemy, the lies of his imps, by the message of your failure. Lot's wife didn't make it because she couldn't get ignore the beacon that was behind her. Peter got pushed off his position. Eve failed because she listened to the beacon of the enemy. You are unstoppable, unbreakable, unyieldable. But the only way you lose is if you listen to the signals of the enemy. I just feel like giving an altar call. I promise you, if I didn't feel it, we'd shut it down right now. There's some discouragement I feel in this building. It's just a spirit of discouragement. There's some new believers that are saying you can't do it. The enemy's in your ear saying you think you can do this and keep this up. Some people have been fighting for something in your life, and you've been fighting and fighting. But every day, there's a beacon saying, come over here, give up. Our scripture says, the devil is angry, full of great wrath, because his time is short. Friend, you're the winner. You're the superpower. Every head bowed and every eye closed.